to give you a longtime friend of the uh, Cannery Row Foundation. Those of you in the, in the Steinbeck world and Ricketts world uh, will certainly recognize uh, our friend Richard Astro back again. Uh, he needs really no introduction, so I won't give him one. He, he's, his, wor his work and his life speaks for himself. He's been a great friend of the Cannery Row Foundation for a, a long, long time. Please welcome Dr. Richard Astro. Good morning, everyone. And I guess the good thing about being first on the program, or one of the good things, is you get to thank the director. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, Michael called me a couple of months ago. Uh, this year has been a very busy year for both my wife, Betty, and me. And at first blush, I said, Michael, I, ju I just can't. I, I don't know that I can. Well, that's Michael. I'm here. Uh, <laughs> And Betty's here, and we are wonderfully glad to be here. And I think that all of us, uh, you know, whether we're English teachers or lay people from various types, all of us here, tremendous debt of gratitude to Michael for, you know, 33 years of keeping this alive. So, Michael, thank you. Why has Steinbeck taken such a beating? from the critical establishment, from other writers, in fact, from a member of Congress, and from some of the general public. And why, and this is the genesis of a talk that I have to give, and I not have to give, that I look forward to giving at San Jose State in a couple of weeks, on Steinbeck as an international writer, why is he better understood? Why have I found people who understand him immediately in Poland? than in Boston or in Philadelphia. So I went from there, and I started looking at the commentaries. Remember this one? The congressman from Oklahoma, who on the floor of the United States House of Representatives said the grapes of wrath was, was the product of a twisted, distorted mind. That was a good one. Or Arthur Meisner. You know, his book on Fitzgerald is magnificent. The best of his books are watered down by 10th weight rate philosophizing. <coughs> this one. Uh, Robert Gottlieb, who is, was not a contemporary, uh, who was the editor of The, of, uh, the New Yorker and then the editor-in-chief uh, of, of Alfred Knopf. Oops, missed. Uh, and a statement like this is, of course, damning with faint praise. But then, then the next part of this essay that he wrote for the New York Review of Books in 2008, it was so painful, I couldn't write it down. So I'm going to read it. And it, the, only, the only thing that's redeeming about it is that he insults all of us. I quote, The force feeding of hundreds of thousands of school kids have to read his work. Who in America considers John Steinbeck seriously today. Apart, full, apart from a handful of Steinbeck academics and some local enthusiasts in Monterey. <laughs> Hurts, don't it? That's just 2008. Clifton Fadiman, the dean of, 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 of the New York critical establishment, during that period of Steinbeck's best work, never could figure out how Steinbeck mixed up in a project like Sea of Cortez. Joseph Henry Jackson of the Chronicle, Francisco, who knew Steinbeck well, visited him in his home. They were friends. Talked about suspicious mysticism? What is that? And then, of course, there was the book burning. Now, this is the Lyle Boren type, st type stuff. Uh, I've, I may be wrong, and maybe I missed something, but I do not know of any other American writer who has ever had an entire book written about the burning and banning of his books, of one book. Uh, and you read the thing, and, and you start, you know, looking at 
the reactions in Oklahoma and in Kern County, uh, you know, in places like Shafter and Arvin, near Bakersfield. I mean, it's painful stuff. So it comes from everywhere. It comes from an intellectual, a so-called intellectual elite, and it comes from the associated growers and congressmen from Oklahoma. And on a personal note, this is a, this is a person you've never heard of, or I hope not, uh, who was a member of my dissertation committee at the University of Washington. Now, he looks happy and innocuous enough, but when I submitted my dissertation, uh, in those days you had to type them longhand, and it was, it was an ordeal, and I mailed it up to the University of Washington, and I thought it was pretty damn good, <laughs> but he didn't. And the reason he didn't is because I did not address Steinbeck's support or his, his failure to condemn the American presence in Vietnam, which, he said, undermined everything good he'd ever done. And, you know, I didn't much like that war either. But the fact of the matter was, my dissertation had nothing to do with Steinbeck's politics. It had to do with Steinbeck and science. But he didn't get it, and I had to spend two months revising my dissertation to placate this guy, and maybe now that's, that's why he's happy riding his bicycle. <laughs> they just didn't get it. And, you know, it was hard on me. I had two months of anguish. Can you imagine how hard it was on this guy? He got it. We know that. He got it. We know that. Joe Campbell. And so did he. Not as famous as the first two, perhaps, but Ralph Boleyn, the first time I talked to him here on this campus, uh, understood Ricketts and Steinbeck implicitly. He understood exactly what was going on. And, and you know, I had the bag of letters at that point, and I, I, I was trying to figure it all out. But Ralph Boleyn, Marine, believe, where Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, an ichthyologist. Isn't that what, it, what Rolf was? He got it. And I'm thinking, what about all these bloody English teachers? <laughs> now, what it, what it really boils down to, and I think what we, you know, what we find, is that Steinbeck, the reality, is not political, as M Mr. Shulman thought. He's not partisan, and he's certainly not parochial. He's, he's biological, he's metaphysical, and at times he's even religious. You know. He learned the first lessons from his creative writing teacher at Stanford, who taught him to write what you know about and use the spotlight over the searchlight. He learned that. He didn't practice it very well in Cup of Gold, but by the time he got to Tua God Unknown and the Pastures of Heaven, he had pretty well figured it out. So he got that from Eden. But then he had to get the other piece. And the other piece, for lack of a better term, is breaking through, which of course is the essay that Ed Ricketts, one of the three Ed Ricketts' essays, and I think of the three the most important. I still struggle a little bit, and I really struggle when I try to teach the essay on, on non-teleological thinking, which of course is the Easter sermon in the log, to a bunch of undergraduates at Drexel University. That's what really turned them upside down, like, what in the hell is this? Uh, because I think a lot, of, a lot of what Ricketts was dealing with is, is hard to put into words. And the fact is that college students, college English majors, particularly those focusing on American literature, American studies, and their faculties, don't really spend a lot of time with any of these people, including Robinson Jeffords. You know, he's just one more coast, West Coaster. Uh, at least he makes the anthology. But you're not going to find Yaakov Burma in an anthology of American or British literature or in any anthology of anything. But this, uh, these guys, of course, these are the people that, that Ricketts read, that they talked about in the lab day after day, night after night, particularly night after night, uh, with or without cheap wine. And, you know, over a period of time, it all came together. 
And it came together in the essay that Ed wrote and that he, of course, never got published until Joel Hedgepeth put it into that, that two-volume collection that the Mad River Press did about 40 years ago. Uh, and I think, I think he was as frustrated as anybody else that he couldn't get it, he couldn't get it out. And I think this is the operative phrase. It's, it's all about transcendence. And how do you put that into, into plain English? It's tough. Uh, the definition, breaking through, as I'm sure many of you know, if not most of you know, came from Robinson Jefferson. Again, Roan Stallion is a long poem, but the key passage, of course, is this one. Humanity is the start of the race, I say. Humanity is the mold to break away from, the crust to break through, the coal to break into fire, the atom to be split. Rumor, rumor, I don't know whether it's rumor or whether it's true, but that Carroll discovered it, discovered Rohn's, this, this passage uh, out of Roan Stallion, ran into the lab where her husband and Ricketts were talking and said, I've got it, I've got it, I've got the definition of breaking through. I don't know whether it's true or not, if it isn't, it probably ought to be, but somehow the three of them, the three of them came to it. Uh, now, others had come to it before, in, albeit in different ways. Again, not English teachers. Ritter and the organismal conception, which was, as far as, as I know, part of the zeitgeist of, of biological instruction here and all over the West Coast at the time, and of course, Ali on the other coast at, at, at Woods Hole. They're different. Uh, his organismal conception and Ali's social life of animals and his animal aggregations kind of go to the same place but in very different ways. And biologists, I think you, a lot of you are much more equipped to talk about that in detail than I am. But they have, I think, one key thing in common, which is we need to study animals in their habitat and not as individual species. And that, of course, is what underlies and underscores between Pacific tides. And I'll never forget when Betty and I were doing, when I was doing the research, and Betty and I went up to the, uh, about on a horrible, blustery day on the west coast of, of where Friday Harbor is on the Straits of, of Juan de Fuca and having a conversation with George and Nettie McGinnity. And here they are, and they were very elderly at the time, and they talked about Steinbeck. They understood Steinbeck better than any English teacher in, in, my, in my English department in Corvallis, Oregon. There was something that biologists got and something that marine scientists got, at least just more easily. And Joe Campbell got it. And I, I had to put this up here. And I will read it because I think it's so telling. The agony of breaking through personal limitations is the agony of spiritual growth. Art, literature, myth, cult, philosophy, and aesthetic disciplines are instruments to help the individual pass limiting horizons into spheres of ever-expanding realization. As he crosses threshold after threshold, conquering dragon after dragon, the stature of divinity that he summons to his highest wish increases until it subsumes the cosmos, and finally, the mind breaks the bounding sphere of the cosmos to a realization transcending all experiences of form, all symbolisms, all divinities, a realization of the ineluctable void. That, to me, says it all. Uh, Campbell, who learned from Ricketts, and I dare say his most famous short work, his most accessible work, the hero with a thousand faces, owes more to probably more to Ed Ricketts than to anybody else. Who breaks through? These are, these are words out of the log. He who can break through the tragic miracle of consciousness. He who can understand that all things are one thing and one thing's all things and can look from the tide pool to the stars and back to the tide pool again and Remember Doc at the end of Cannery Row who can savor the hot taste of life. 
Who breaks through? Character after character into Stein, in Steinbeck's fiction. And there are more. I forgot Dick Winter. D uh, Doc Winter and the Moon is Down. Um, and of course, who can forget Casey and, and Tom. And, you know, in, compare these two novels. And this is what I tried to deal with my students. In Indubious Battle, no one breaks through. It's why the battle is dubious. It's why neither, it's why neither the communist organizers nor the strikers can win because neither can see whole pictures. Cannery Row, whom my students at Drexel complained about, there is no plot. Of course there is no plot. Cannery Row is a picture. It's a world. And it's a world that was then, and it's a world that is in this room right now. They didn't get it. Now, with a little coaching, they got much better at it. Those are the misunderstandings we see so often. And Cannery Row, along with Of Mice and Men, in addition to The Grapes of Wrath, believe it or not, when I got to Florida in my, first, uh, in my, in my job at the University of Central Florida and met the provost, my, my counterpart, at the University of West Florida in Pensacola, I was told that Cannery Row had been banned in the Pensacola public schools. My God, why? Because Doc sees a, a dead woman? I mean, I won't read this, but again, it comes out, comes out of the log. The battles are dubious. The battles are dubious, whether they're in the tide pools or in a peach orchard in, in the San Joaquin Valley. What did happen, finally, after enough folks got it? It's, it started right here. That's why I, I'm thrilled to be in this room where it started, where the Ralph Bullens and the Izzy Abbots, and, and, and then, you know, and then uh, Charles Bacter and Steve, who I had never met before, and it was a thrill, thrill to meet him this morning at the aquarium, which is a magnificent enterprise, uh, would be as Ed would like it to have been. But certainly the genesis of, of, of this aquarium, which was to study animals in their habitat, habitat here, rather than exotic creatures from halfway around the globe, is what distinguishes this aquarium and what has driven changes in aquaria throughout the country. Steve, that's your quote. <laughs> okay. I read I was impressed. Now, all right, that's Monterey. Let me go, let me go, let me go a, a few thousand miles away. All right, you've, I don't know whether anybody's ever heard of this guy. He was one of the, one of the leaders, one of the three or four most important leaders of the Polish opposition uh, to the regime that ultimately fell in, in, 18, in 1989. Uh, I got to know him. Uh, anecdotally, it, it just happened. It was happenstance. And I remember having dinner with him and a good friend of mine who was fluent in both Polish and English. He started, when he found out, when he knew I, I was an English teacher, he started talking to me about the Grapes of Wrath. And what he said was, he, he got it completely. He understood what Steinbeck was doing in that book, that it was not just a book about good guys against, against bad guys. It was a book about, about a whole system in which there is good and bad on every side and in which the human interaction with the natural environment during the worst, the worst natural disaster probably in, in American history. Uh, he got it all. He got it all, and he, and he gave, and he said this. He said, you know, I remember when I was in jail, because he was arrested a couple hundred times, and they came to me in 1986, and they offered me a home on the Riviera and a million dollars if I would leave Poland and never come back, and I would be out of jail forever. And I said to my jailer, sir, I'm not the one who's in jail. You are. He got it. And of course, the result was the round table, solidarity, and the emergence not only of Miknik, but of Lech Wałęsa, and a Poland that is radically different today 
than it was then. And finally, and I think I'm down to about two minutes. Finally, I had to show you a picture of Joel. But when I was at Oregon State, and after the book came out, I said, we've got to do more of this. And so I wrote a development grant to the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I went to see Grant and tried to get matching money. Can you imagine a bunch of you, you biologists in here in 1976 going to see Grant and asking for a quarter of a million dollars in, in 1976 money to match 800,000 NEH and getting it for a literature in the C program? It boggles the mind, but it happened. It happened because Sea Granters and Marine people at Oregon State got it too. It took a little explaining, but they understood it in ways my colleagues in the English department never did. And from that, and this is my last slide, from that, and this, is, this was the head of Sea Grant. I mean, he was a Sea Grant administrator, Bill Wick. And he went out and read the log, and he came back and endorsed their proposal and sent it to Washington. And from that, even though Betty and I were gone, we were in Boston by that time, they, a challenge grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities that grew out of the development grant that we got led to a permanent, permanently endowed center for interdisciplinary humanistic instruction that branched out into disciplines beyond the humanities. And the driving force for that to this day, uh, so I understand, is this man. Not a humanist, not an English teacher, not a philosopher, a marine geologist, John. A marine geologist, John Byrne. Now, Joel and I did some work on him. But John Byrne, as, pr as dean of oceanography, gave me a B and I'll never forgive him, because <laughs> I was an undergraduate there too became chief administrator of NOAA, and then when he went back to Oregon State as president, he drove this, this center, got it a building, and this, is, and, got, and this is his quote. And the last sentence, we sponsor activities on campus and in the community that explores challenging issues across cultural and disciplinary boundaries and demonstrate the relevance of the humanities to a wider public, if there is anything that the Cannery Row Foundation, that all of you, all of us, scientists, humanists alike, can do to, uh, to, to help us understand better in all its complexity the world we live in and what we can do to make it better, both naturally and in terms of human beings, it is through this kind of interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, integrated approach to knowledge. That's what Steinbeck and Ed Ricketts were all about. And that's why events like this are so important. Thank you. <laughs> that, no, that,